everyone. I'm Nina Davalori. I'm a filmmaker, activist, host, and former Miss America. I'm so excited to be able to speak with all of you today. I'm coming from New York, and I know a lot of you are all over the country as well. So this is a, um, an interesting time for us, but I'm glad that we're all able to be here and connect virtually in one way or another. Um, to kind of kick things off, I wanted to just share a little bit about my journey and, and where you know life has brought me um, today, I suppose. I think uh, a lot of people always ask, you know, why Miss America? That was kind of one of, uh, I suppose, what launched my career and, and one of the reasons where I'm at right now. Um, and so I actually started competing in the organization for scholarship money. Um, I knew that I wanted to go to college. I uh, was living in Michigan at the time, and I knew college was astronomically expensive, as I'm sure many of you are discovering as well. And so it was actually one of my friends who told me about the Miss America competition. And as I got to learn more about the organization, I learned that there were four pillars to the organization. One is scholarship, first and foremost. The other is success, service, and style. Uh, so it was a, a really great way. I was always actively involved in my community. I knew I had a platform, and so it was a really great way to get involved um, in the organization and, of course, pay for college. So uh, a little bit about my background. Uh, I was born in Syracuse, New York, but my grandparents actually raised me in India for two years. So my first spoken language was Telugu. And when I had come back, my parents moved to Oklahoma at the time, and that was um, a really interesting time for me and my family. Um, I was often mistaken for Native American. Um, I was asked questions like, what does the red dot mean? Do you worship cows? Um, people would say my house smells like curry, which is to this day probably true, um, but it didn't make it any less hurtful. And I think I realized that after growing up in Oklahoma, my family moved to Michigan, and several of those misconceptions and stereotypes about my background and heritage continued to follow me. And so I constantly found myself in conversations correcting those stereotypes. Um, and that's really how my platform started, was recognizing that um, it, is a, it is an open conversation and cultural competency has to happen from both sides. And when someone does ask you a question, you have to be willing and able to answer um, and share our culture and heritage. And so that's how uh, my platform of celebrating diversity came to life. Um, I actually remember competing in the team pageant in the Miss America teen competition. Um, and after that, I placed first runner up at Miss America teen. And through that, I earned $30,000 in scholarship money. I went to the University of Michigan and I graduated. My degree was in brain behavior and cognitive science. And, you know, I thought I was on the good Indian girl path of applying to medical school. And, um, you know, that's what I thought life was, where life was going to take me. Um, and yet again, I found myself in a situation where um, med school and any graduate degree is, of course, expensive. And uh, so I started competing again. I took about five years off from organization and I had moved back to New York at the time. And um, I was applying to medical school and I started competing for Miss New York. And the first time I competed, I was, um, I was 23, you have to be the ages of, 20, of 18 and 24 to compete. And the first time I competed for Miss New York, I placed a second runner up. And I placed second runner up to Mallory Hagen, who if any of you follow the journeys of Miss Americas, uh, Mallory went on to win the title of Miss America representing the state of New York. And I remember watching that competition from home and I called my mom and I said, mom, I will never win Miss America now. What are the chances that Miss New York will win two years in a row? And she said to me, well, Nina, you haven't even won Miss New York yet. That's the first step to even getting to this goal. Uh, so why don't we focus on that first? And uh, I remember sitting down with my, my sister afterwards and she asked me, her and I are 18 months apart. She's one of my best friends. And she asked me, you know, why are you, why are you competing? What are you really going to get out of it? And 
I said to her, you know, I sincerely believe that Miss America will be someone who's ethnic. Um, and that's not to pull the race card or say, pick me, I'm brown. It was just very timely for an organization like Miss America to finally be representative of what diversity in America looked like for me growing up and what it is today. Uh, granted, I won seven years ago, so a lot has changed. Um, but, you know, I went in wanting to be the first South Asian and, uh, and bring that representation because I grew up watching Miss America feeling that I could never be in that role because I didn't look a certain way. I, did, I didn't have blonde hair. I didn't have blue eyes. I didn't have a, what people would consider a normal talent. And so for me, it was really about that young girl who was watching the night I won and for her to say, wow, this year Miss America like, looks like me. And, uh, you know, I give you a spoiler alert, I suppose, but um, the second year I came back, I ended up winning the title of Miss New York and went on to win the title of Miss America. And it's very difficult to put that moment into exact words of how you're feeling. It's such a, there's so many emotions going through you. It goes by so quickly. It's a live telecast. Um, and I remember the, the night I won, uh, there were a lot of xenophobic and racist comments that were made um, because of my winning. I was called a terrorist. I was called Miss 7-Eleven. Um, I remember reading a tweet that said 9-11 was two days ago and you know we have a terrorist as Miss America. Um, and I think recognizing that I was, I've always said, you know, my platform was celebrating diversity through cultural competency and recognizing my role and how powerful of a moment this, this was. Um, and to be able to correct those conversations, to rise above that. And I will say for every negative comment, tweet, or post, I received hundreds of positive, encouraging ones of people around the world, uh, really recognizing and, and saying that, and standing up and saying this isn't right. Um, and so continuing throughout my year, that's what I continued to activate and advocate for, was celebrating diversity through cultural competency. Um, I think the basis of cultural competency is that, you know, not everyone is going to have the same values or beliefs, but we can all have open and constructive conversations with respect. Um, and that's a program that I started called Circles of Unity, and I was able to take that across the country where colleges and universities were able to implement that program in their um, in their own college and hometowns as well. The other piece of the conversation that I remember having um, have advocated for uh, beginning that night was this idea of skin color. And I remember waking up to a different headline in India, in an Indian newspaper, and it said, is Miss America too dark to be Miss India? And this was something that had followed me throughout my entire life. I think growing up in a South Asian family, you hear comments like, don't go out in the sun, you're going to get too dark. Um, or, oh, you'd be so much more beautiful if you were a few shades lighter. And uh, for me, reading a headline like that was the moment where I said, enough is enough. Um, why are we so quick to impose beauty standards, um, especially for women more so than our male counterparts? Um, and why is being fair skinned considered more beautiful or ideal or more successful? Um, and so that was a conversation that I was able to have with many um, colleges and universities across the country with students. And I realized that there was a real need to, to tell stories about this, um, to tell stories of colorism. And uh, that's the project that I am able to work on today, which was really exciting. I'll definitely dive a little more into it. Um, but, you know, I think a couple highlights throughout my career before I jump into talking about complexion uh, that really impacted me and how I even got drawn to the documentary space was, um, was being able to work with the Obama administration. Um, I was able to work with their White House initiative on Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. I know this is an election year and an incredibly important election year. So I hope that you will all who are 18 um, and over are able to get out and vote and use your voices. Uh, but I worked really closely with them. Um, I also worked with Michelle Obama's campaign, um, Let's Move, Let's Read, as well as Let Girls Learn. And through that, I was introduced to the documentary space. Um, one in particular was Girl Rising. And um, I worked with their team to help the launch of Girl Rising India, of telling stories of young girls around the world and their access to education. 
um, and realizing how much power there was in storytelling. And I think it's one thing to uh, be able to, to talk about it and share stories. It's another thing to actually see it through a visual medium. Um, and so that was kind of what drew me to this, to the filmmaking space. And so about two years ago, I enrolled in um, theater and film school and uh, here in New York, and I finished that last year. And through the time, through my time that I was there, I was actually invited to speak at a conference um, in Dubai. And I met my amazing director, who is a female um, director. Also, the majority of her team and production company um, is also female led. And so uh, we started talking and she's been in the documentary film space uh, for quite some time and sort of became my mentor in this space. And I remember telling my story about complexion, about the morning after I won and talking about colorism around the world. And because, you know, we both resonated with each other, that's how I got started in even producing and hosting complexion uh, was was partnering and working with her team as well. And so last year we were at Venice Film Festival um, almost exactly a year ago uh, when, when you guys will see this. Um, and that was such a wonderful memory. And I remember we were there presenting our concept of complexion and thinking this is so much bigger than one group or one community. We have to tell this story globally. And um, thankfully we had the team and funding to be able to do it. Um, which was a lot of hard work. It's also, you have to put an entrepreneur hat when you go into filmmaking. And, um, you know, thankfully I had worked with so many incredible people along the way. And uh, we started filming in Italy actually. And um, we wanted to tell stories of each country and how colorism affects every community and culture. And after Italy, we went to um, India in January and we filmed our India and Bangladesh chapter. And that was incredibly life-changing. I think for, for me, for a lot of reasons, I knew that we were gonna have such powerful stories to, to tell and share. And it was also just so personal to me. And I think that's what made all the difference is having the right team, having the right community and people behind you and people who also believe that the story needed to be told. Uh, and so from there, we were actually supposed to start filming our African series and African chapters. Um, and we were supposed to end at Cannes Film Festival. Uh, but of course, life, you know, I think all of us, the world changed and um, we were faced with something that we had, you know, we were faced with this pandemic and we really had to ask ourselves, okay, how can we tell this story in a powerful way? How can we continue the work that we're, de that we're doing in a time when the world really needed it? Uh, and so my team and I, we pivoted. And uh, we started releasing complexion of, of the footage that we had from India in just short series. You guys can check it out. Um, I'm on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, all the platforms at Nina Davalori and at Complexion Series. Um, but so far we started releasing clips um, and you know, just small little drops and really poignant stories of colorism of people that we had met and seen and had gotten to know and love. And uh, then, right, you know, I think what was interesting is, is that we started releasing these chapters in May and then the world changed again with the death of George Floyd, unfortunately. And I think through the Black Lives Matter movement, um, there have been many conversations about race and how it pertains to cultures around the world. And one of the huge issues our skin whitening products and also this idea that white skin is better, that fair skin is better or more successful and provides more opportunities for people um, if you're lighter skin. And that's certainly a beauty standard that's in South Asia, but Africa and many East Asian countries. And I remember uh, I started a petition because there were certain uh, companies such as Unilever, L'Oreal, Johnson & Johnson and Procter & Gamble who produce skin whitening creams um, and sell this ideology that fair skin is the golden ticket to life. Um, and so through that petition and through all the support of so many people who felt the same way, who were finally speaking out about this, this issue and cause um, around the world, we were able to actually, um, Johnson & Johnson announced that they would discontinue their line of skin whitening products. Uh, Unilever changed its uh, hero product, I suppose, called Fair and Lovely to now Glow and Lovely. Um, and L'Oreal also announced that they were ending the use of Fair, White and Light. 
in any of their branding and packaging. Uh, do I think that's enough? No, I do not think that's enough. I don't think a simple name change solves this global issue. Um, I think really to get down to the core of it, we have to have these conversations in our families. Uh, we have to correct that when someone does say, don't go out in the sun to us, um, or, oh, you know, you're not going to get married because you're dark, um, or you won't get that job if you don't use this product. And so I think another piece of this conversation that we started having with complexion and uh, the petition and what else, you know, what this ideology, how has, how has it been built over years, is that we have to look at Bollywood. And um, I think Bollywood is a huge industry that, of course, perpetuates the very similar stereotypes. So I think all of these pieces from the products to ads, media, Bollywood representation, all adds up and they've all built this ideology that fair skin is is more successful, more beautiful. Um, and until they actively also start dismantling it, I don't think change, true change can really happen. So that is the path that I've been continuing um, and journey to go on. And that's where we're at in the process. I'm excited to say that, um, stay tuned. I have a very exciting announcement about Complexion Series uh, coming up and where you can watch it. Uh, so that's gonna be really great. And then of course, once it's safe and we're all able to film again, we're gonna continue telling that important story. Uh, so you guys can follow along on that journey. That's one of the main things I've been working on right now. Um, most recently, I'm excited to say, um, I've been accepted to Harvard Business School for their Business of Media, Entertainment and Sports program. Um, so I will be doing that next year, which is a, a, a new little chapter in my journey. And um, I think, you know, all of these things, it's, it seemed to um, coincide in the right ways, but I feel like, you know, people ask, how did you know you wanted to do this? And I said, you just, you really have to follow your passion. And I would like to leave you guys with some advice um, that I have picked up along the way in terms of discovering my path and finding my path. And I hope that it helps you guys as well. Um, but the first, I always say, try, try again. Um, for me, my dream college, um, I think many of you are on that path and, and looking into where you want to go next and discovering that. So for me, my dream college was University of Michigan. I knew that's where I wanted to go. It was exactly where, um, it was where my sister went, like loved it. And I remember applying my senior year. I actually only applied to two schools, University of Michigan and Michigan State University. And I got waitlisted at University of Michigan. Um, and I was incredibly devastated <laughs> and to make a long story short, I actually, um, decided to not take the wait list, uh, went to Michigan State University and, um, for my freshman year and then transferred to University of Michigan my, um, sophomore year. And so I tell that story to say that sometimes plan A doesn't happen the way that you want it to, but there's always a way to get there. You just have to find the right way for you. And, you know, my plan B was, was MSU when I went there for a year and then I got to plan A in some way, shape and form. So I think if you really want something, try, try again, because there's always a way. The second little piece of advice is to be yourself. Um, I know that is so cliche, everyone says it, um, but I think one of the biggest things that I've learned, especially if you are interviewing or jobs and internships, college applications, et cetera, is that to have a genuine normal conversation with someone rather than just telling them what you think they want to hear is so much more powerful, is so much more impactful than, you know, just trying to be something that you're not. So always be yourself um, and, and stay true to who you are. The third I would have to say is follow your instincts. Uh, this is something that no one can tell you or no one can do for you. You have to you have to trust your, trust your gut, trust your instincts, trust yourself. Um, one of the things that someone told me, actually quite a few people told me, to be honest, was um, they said, you know, Nina, if you really wanna win, change your talent because Miss America just isn't ready for someone like you. Uh, you're too Indian, be more American. And I did, I, I performed a Bollywood dance for my talent. Um, I grew up a classically trained uh, Bharatanatyam dancer, which is a traditional form of Indian dance. 
Um, and it was just such a huge part of who I was. And I loved that art form. Uh, I can sing not as well as I can dance. So someone said to me, why don't you go back to singing? And I said, you know, I just, and I thought about it, especially for the, the, the second time I was competing. It was my last year. I had one last shot at, at Miss New York and Miss America. And so I really did think about it. And I remember someone gave me the best piece of advice. And they said, when you leave, when you lay your head on your pillow at night, you have to know that you have represented yourself truly and authentically. And for me, that was, that was staying true to my culture and my roots. And so I, I chose to do the, um, an Indian dance and um, it paid off in the end. I will always say that it was, you know, performing my talent on the Miss America stage, something that no one had ever done before. Um, and, and for little girls to see that, that was truly my winning moment. And, um, you know, I think the, my crowning moment was just icing on the cake. Um, so that was really special to me. So follow your instincts, trust your judgment, um, and, and know who you are. Uh, the last one is a little fun one. I usually share it with younger audiences, but um, I want to share it with you guys because I think the message will always still resonate. Um, is, is understand that your words have influence. Uh, I remember when I was in sixth grade, there was a young boy who shall remain anonymous. And he said, oh my goodness, Nina Davalori has a bigger mustache than my dad. And it was kind of true, but it didn't make it any less hurtful. <laughs> and, you know, this person can go on to become the next president, the next CEO, the next senator, whatever it might be. And I will always, I will forever remember him for that one comment. So know that your words have influence and we have the choice to influence people in a positive way um, or negative way. So um, I hope you'll all carry that forward with you and um, recognize that we do have that choice and how we're not only using our words, but of course, um, nowadays social media as well. Uh, so that's all I have for you guys today. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I know we're going to get into a little Q&A portion. Um, so I will go ahead and get that started. Uh, and of course, uh, keep the conversation going. So I have a couple questions that you guys have submitted. And the first one, you guys ask great questions. Uh, the first one was, how do you manage your time with all of the different tasks that you take on? Ooh, um, priorities. I think you have to prioritize what is most important or you know, what is maybe gonna take the longest task. But I think for me also learning what my priorities were, were seeing which ones I did first, seeing which ones I enjoyed doing first. If I was excited to do something, I would get it done. And if I was you know, in between, it was always kind of in the back of my mind or um, you know, I would procrastinate and push it off. So my best advice is obviously prioritize, but that's also recognizing, hey, what do, what do I like want to wake up and do? Like, what can't I wait to get to start doing? Um, and thinking about it that way, I think that way it's also you're following your true passion and what you like doing. Um, and that's always really helpful to constantly think about even as we go through college careers, you know, um, jobs as well. The second question, what gave you the inspiration to produce complexion? Ooh, uh, you know, like I, I said, growing up in a South Asian family, you know, there were always comments about my skin color. It was just very normalized um, from a young age. I remember actually uh, going to my dermatologist when I was in third grade. Um, and I was actually in India at the time. I was there visiting my family there and I had a patch of eczema on my skin. And uh, the dermatologist there, he gave me a cream and um, he said, you know, use this twice a day and it, you know, it should go away. And I remember I was eight years old at the time and I looked at him directly and I said, do you have a cream that will make me lighter? And it's moments like that I think are really important because as young as eight years old for me, but when we were filming Complexion, we realized that there were girls as young as four years old who were using these skin whitening products because they genuinely believed that that's what they needed to be considered beautiful. Um, I think the, the last sort of piece and straw for me was um, 
how this followed me through Miss America as well. Um, and, and waking up to that headline and recognizing that there are millions of young girls around the world who are feeling this way. And um, how do we actually change that and dismantle colorism? And that was the impetus, was really thinking about those young girls, thinking back to eight-year-old Nina, thinking back to all of the people we've met along the way and so many more um, that we have yet to meet. Um, this, is, this is a very real issue. And unless we talk about it openly, um, we're not able to, to actually create effective change. Um, third, number three, question number three. If you could give advice to anyone struggling with self-image, what would it be? Um, I, I would say that ask, ask, try to pinpoint the moment that made you feel insecure about something. Was it something someone said? Was it something you saw? Was it, um, you know, how, you know, ask yourself, why are you struggling with that? And I think after you ask yourself that and pinpoint an answer, whether that is, um, you know, internally within yourself or externally, someone said something or you saw something, I think it's really important to have honest conversations about them. Uh, because I guarantee you that you're not alone in many of our struggles. None of us are alone. Sometimes we have to ask for it and be able to ask for help, have these open conversations um, and get to really the, the core of, of why you might be feeling this way. So um, find those trusted friends, uh, friends, family members, have have people that you can talk to that are, are you know, going to know and love you for no matter what you're going through and will always support you. Um, and, you know, those people exist all around us. Uh, and so recognizing who they are and, and knowing where you can go to, I think, is really important. Um, number four, what was it like working with the Obama administration? Uh, so this is one of my favorite stories to tell. So I um, am excited to share it with you guys. Uh, so the first time I was actually at the White House um, in 2014 on behalf of the Children's Miracle, Net Children's Miracle Network Hospitals. Um, and um, I, was, I served as a Goodwill Ambassador for them throughout my year. And uh, they do an incredible week called uh, Champion, Champion Week. And it's where they bring one child from every state and their families and bring them to Disney World for one week. And then we do a tour in, in Washington, DC for the next week. Um, and it's a really special moment because some of these children are still going through treatment, some of them are still ill, and Children's Miracle Network Hospital is the one that steps in to, um, to provide care for children whose families can't afford it. Uh, and so that was really special because just being there with these, with these children and their families at Disney World in the most magical place on earth was certainly one memorable moment. And then when we went to Washington, D.C., um, we were scheduled to have a Q&A or the children were scheduled to have a Q&A with um, President Obama at the time. And so he comes out, he does a really lovely Q&A with the children and um, he was staged to take a picture. And so he was staged to take one right next to me. So um, he says, oh, you know, Miss America, congratulations. We're all so proud of you. Um, and I said, thank you. So I thought, great, you know, that's my moment of meeting the president. And then I was actually pulled aside by one of his uh, staff members and he said, Nina, would you like to meet the president? And I said, uh-huh. And I realized I'm being led to the Oval Office by him. And um, I see President Obama waiting there for me. And uh, he said, oh yes, like Nina, please come join me. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, Barack, sure. <laughs> um, I didn't say that, of course. I said, of course, President Obama. Um, and so that was just a really memorable conversation and moment. Um, and I think that's also the moment my parents thought I had a legitimate job <laughs> was after that. Um, and so working with them was actually just very enlightening. I was able to do a lot of work with them, also launched um, Act to Change, which is an anti-bullying campaign. Um, and so it was just a really wonderful time and, and what really put me on the path to activism as well. Uh, finally, question number five, what advice would you give to a young girl who wants to enter the film industry? Ooh, this one is this one is loaded, um, and I'll be very honest. It is not glamorous. So I would I will always say, don't do it for fame, don't do it for money, don't do it for the glamour. 
do it for the right reasons, do it for you. And I think even with Miss America, everyone thinks it's this, you know, be, like amazingly glamorous uh, job. And it's really not, you know, it's, it's really much a service job. Um, I was traveling every other day. I was on a flight every other day, which seems crazy now. Um, and, you know, traveling around different countries in the world, um, going in the communities and meeting young people. And it wasn't about, um, the red carpets or any of the glitz and glamour, because that rarely exists and it often doesn't mean anything or continue to last. Uh, so, so do it for the right reasons. Um, I, you know, for me, it was, I, I knew that I, I had to tell other people's stories. It's what I love doing. Um, and I think that's really important that we also share our own stories through that process, uh, which is why I was, I was really gravitated towards it. Um, but you know, those red carpets, ben you know, even at Venice Film Festival, those red carpets last a moment. Um, they go by really quickly and yes, they are enjoyable, but it is not the day to day. So um, understand that that's, that's the life. Uh, and so I, I hope that uh, this conversation has helped. Um, I hope you've gotten to know me. Um, and, and just to kind of sum things up, uh, I just would love to say, um, continue to follow me um, with updates. But for you guys, um, I'm just so proud of all of you for even joining this incredible conversation and, and conference. There's some amazing women involved in this, in this program and organization. And um, I'm just so, so grateful that you guys took the time to come listen to me. Um, and hopefully we can keep the conversation. So with that, I'll close and say, know who you are, love who you are, and stand up for who you are. And um, hopefully I'll connect with you next time.